Moving on to guitars, uh, there are essentially three different pairs of guitars. We've got a pair of main rhythm guitars, which are just playing power chords. We've got some overdubbed guitars, which are playing a kind of arpeggiated and rung out pattern over the, the intro and chorus. And then we have a pair of non-symmetrical guitars, which, uh, which kind of play off each other during the verse. Let's start by looking at the rhythm guitars. I tracked these with a, a PRS Custom 24 with bare knuckle pickups. And again, being an E standard, um, you've got a lot of options open to you in terms of tone. Uh, so first of all, let's take a look at the rhythm guitars. Uh, these tracks here were generated using an amp sim, which is made by uh, Scuffum Amps. I think it's a really great amp sim, especially for higher tune stuff where it's not really all about super high gain tones. I forget actually which model I used, but I printed it down. I ran it through some custom made impulse responses that, that I made, actually funnily enough, here at Middle Farm. Um, and I think the tone came out really cool. This is using a PRS Custom 24 guitar. However, the tone was really quite dark. So you can see here the EQ, which is the only processing I've done to these guitars, is reducing a lot of the kind of mid-range emphasis and uh, bringing in some extra top end and a little bit of extra low end too. So I'll show you what the guitars sound like with no EQ and then what they sound like with a bit of EQ applied. You have to resist the temptation to feel that um, that it sounds too scooped when you do that because whenever you compare back against a kind of darker and more mid-rangey source it can be really difficult sometimes to appreciate the new brighter version it can often sound a little bit harsh by comparison um, but in this case that mid-range spike was causing a lot of issues once you chucked it into the mix on top of everything else and applying that EQ allowed it to sit amongst the other instruments especially the the drums which do occupy like way more top and bottom end information. It's really important when you're A-being to not lose sight of the fact that you're is probably going to be drawn to the darker, more mid-rangey version. Um, oftentimes you'll find that by the time you've EQ'd something to sound really good in a mix, it might sound a little bit more harsh uh, than the un-EQ'd version. However, if you don't directly A-B it, you don't think that way. It's just one of those things. I guess our ears naturally tend towards the kind of smoother version. So with that EQ carried out on the guitars, I found there wasn't really any need for any more processing. I mean, the guitars are they're really not very dynamic. Uh, there's no palm muting, which is causing excess low end to, to flub around. And I made sure that as much as possible, the source tone was really you know, well played and, and well captured so that so there wasn't really anything to fix in the mix. Um, so to move on to the overdubbed guitars here, um, we've got a pair, we've, they're playing the same thing, but I did one side tracked with a Strat and the other with the same PRS that I tracked the rhythm guitars with. So um, to get these to sit on top, I find that in general, when trying to sit overdubbed guitars on top of rhythm guitars, you have to extract quite a lot of low end. Um, as in you have to remove a lot of low end for it not to kind of just add way too much muddy frequency wash in the mix. So you can see I've got a very drastic high pass filter going on here. It's like 200 Hertz and then using just purely subtractive EQ to cut um, a few of the more harsh frequencies out. Something I often find, especially with guitars, is if you high pass them quite aggressively, it kind of uncovers this need to cut all sorts of frequencies up in the kind of upper mid range and treble, um, just because otherwise it gets really kind of thin and abrasive sounding. So you can see here, I've used subtractive EQ to cut all sorts of uh, junk out of the, the guitars up here. I'll show you what the overdubbed guitars sounded like on their own. And then I'll bring in the EQ to show you. These were using a different cabinet impulse than the rhythm guitars, so they needed a little bit of extra work too, just to play nice alongside the rhythm guitars. So you can hear I've carved away a gigantic amount of those guitars and it sounds extreme on its own but when you put them alongside the rhythm guitars you'll hear why because there's just no need for them to have any body. All you really want to hear is like the chiminess of the notes ringing out and it's not even about being super distinct but just giving this huge wash of sound when combined with the rhythm guitar. So I'll show you what that sounds like with the two channels together.
so that's what I've done in terms of, of EQ on these overdubbed guitars. Uh, I also thought it would be nice to add a little bit of, um, of echo to them. And I've got a kind of ping pong going on here with a quarter note on one side and an eighth note on the other. Just to give an extra bit of movement to this guitar and make it a bit washier. Uh, I've used the studio tape mode in this plugin called Echo Boy. But notice I've also filtered out quite a lot of the low and high end to make it not uh, become too indistinct. Too much high end in, in delays, especially on guitars and vocals, I can find, uh, I often find it just a bit distracting. You, you get too much repetition of the, of the attack frequencies and it just doesn't sound very good to my ears. So plenty of high and low cut. So with the echo on there, it's just a bit of extra texture there. And then finally, I noticed that there was a couple of, well, there was a frequency in particular, this one here, 3.3K, that was a bit harsh. So I'll show you what it sounds like without, and then I'll engage it, and hopefully you'll hear that that just, uh, again, tames uh, some of the, the bite on the guitars as kind of a whistling frequency that I'm just not very keen on. These little notch moves applied across basically everything in the mix uh, for me add up to tracks that are way easier to make louder in the mix because those kinds of harsh whistles and and resonant frequencies just eat up so much space once you make that the track that contains them loud in the mix so for me those are some of the most important moves in in my mixing actually just finding the right frequencies to cut in these very narrow notches in order that as a whole that track then becomes something which is way less uh, aggressive on the ear and therefore you can make louder and more present in the mix without it dominating. During the verse we've got a couple of different guitars, these are both recorded with my Strat. We've got one which is just a kind of percussive constant um, eighth note guitar and on the other side we have these kind of held chords that are shimmery and I use the, the trem bar a little bit to give them a bit of extra movement and they have quite similar treatments. I mean the, uh, the right hand guitar has very little going on on it, the, the kind of percussive guitar, and the left one has an echo applied to it. But let's just, let's dive in and listen to the uh, percussive guitar and we'll see what I've done to treat that. So I'll bypass the processing here. <laughs> been talking a lot about these notches and here's one appearing in a very different frequency range to where I typically do them. What I found here is because I'm palm muting that one note, the root note E, so much in this riff, it's a little bit overbearing. So I actually went and found the frequency of that note and cut it. Uh, it seems a little bit counterintuitive to cut the fundamental tone of the note that you're playing, but by doing that it actually allows the rest of the kind of percussive character of the, the sound to come through and you don't get this kind of uh, bogged down sound with too much of that low end there. Again, you might be tempted to take that out with a much wider cut and end up with a sound that uh, perhaps lacks a bit of character. So it's kind of nice to take care of that with a narrow notched filter. I'm also using quite a steep high pass filter here set at 78 to just prevent any extra low end from being there. So let me just show you, I'll only engage and disengage the, the fundamental tone notch just so you can hear what's going on. So that really cleans up the part and makes it sound um, a lot kind of tighter. After that, I've engaged a little bit of compression with this amazing Distressor clone made by, um, by Slate, again, Slate Digital. I've got it set fairly moderately with uh, kind of medium attack and release settings and a three to one ratio. And it's just kind of there to, um, just to congeal that sound a little bit more. It doesn't need much dynamic control, but I like the sound of the compressor on this. It's giving a little bit of extra extra vibe, I guess. I'm not using it on full mix though. So um, let me show you what it sounds like first without, and then I'll engage the compressor and you can hear. I love that little kind of, um, that wetness that you get on the attack uh, with the compressor engaged, it's really nice. Um, and that was all I really felt was necessary to, to do on, on that guitar. On the other side, um, I've got you know, a similar high pass filter, a bit higher up this time and trimming up a bit of low mids, as well as notching out a kind of resonant node up at like the 2.3K area. 
And I'm also following it up with a really long, um, very analog sounding um, delay with a lot of modulation on it, just to fill the gaps in between the, the chords. So I'll show you what that sounds like. If I were to bypass the EQ and delay, it would sound like this. So you can hear it does have quite a lot of kind of low end junk in there. So you can see why I've high passed it so much. And the delay just adds a, a really beautiful sustain to everything happening there. Thank you. 